You're listening to Elevate, the official podcast of Elite Agent Magazine for real estate industry sales professionals, property managers, and leaders. Each episode, we bring you behind the scenes coaching, news analysis, exclusive interviews, technology, and more to help you list more, sell more, and elevate your results. To subscribe to the magazine, visit eliteagent.com.au forward slash subscribe. Here is your host, Samantha McLean. Hey, hey, Samantha McLean from Elite Agent. I am super excited to bring you this week's podcast guest. He is one of my favorite people in the industry. That's Mark McLeod. To some, he's simply just known as Macca. Mark is the Chief of Growth for Australia's largest franchise group, that's Ray White. He's been a regular in Elite Agent for the last three years and is known for his no-nonsense, straight-talking, sensible approach to coaching in the industry. While he rarely coaches groups outside Ray White, we've been lucky enough a couple of times to have him on the Transform Coaching Panel, where participants have often said to me, wow, you really saved the best to last. So in this podcast, we're not only talking leadership, which is the theme of the current issue, but also about some of the things that are topical right now. What Mark is doing to support the Ray White Group during this slower time in the market, the types of dinner table conversations that are really important right now and how to influence them, the theory of three sales and so much more. I'm sure you guys will get a lot out of this special episode with Mark McLeod. Welcome to the podcast, Mark McLeod. Thanks, Sam. How are you, mate? I'm really well, thanks, and it's really good to see you in North Sydney. Yes, obviously. yes. Very busy North Sydney. It's haven't been over here for a while. It's a fantastic part of Sydney. Lots of construction going it's on. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. So thanks for coming in today. No I mean, worries. we want to talk growth with you. You did some transform coaching again with us this year, and again, you were probably the most popular coach with your direct, no-nonsense approach to mm-hmm. the market and all things to do with listing, selling, prospecting, particularly moving stock. Yeah. So let's talk about a couple of those things. So your official title actually is Chief of Growth at Ray White. Yeah. So in a market where values are coming off and some agents are finding it quite tough out there at the moment, what are some of the conversations that you're having about growth right now? The major conversation that we're having is that this market, albeit challenging for many of our people and many of the industry creates enormous opportunities on the flip side of that. Mm -hmm. You know, you can look at the market and you can be paralysed by it or you can look at the market and look at the opportunities that are created. There's going to be in our industry at any given time, there's always going to be people wanting to sell and always going to be people wanting to buy, you know. How much of that transaction or how many of those transactions you can get, I believe, is going to be driven by your energy. And I think energy is one of the really key factors in this marketplace. If you look at the way the market changes, the market post whatever we call this now provided artificial energy or provided not artificial, it was real energy, but it was energy that was given to our industry externally. Yeah. I talk to our members that there's two types of energy in a real estate business. There's external energy, which we have little control over. It's controlled by factors beyond our control. And there's internal energy, which we have total control over. And I think it's about understanding and harnessing internal energy into the right areas. I always say to people, all the vendors who are coming to the market today have heard the same news clips, read the same news clips, saw the same news stories read the AFR yesterday, saw exactly the same thing as what we did, but yet they continue and choose to come to the market. And I think that's a a really smart platform to come. These people have come to the market for a reason. And acknowledging that the next thing where I think is really important is this thing called vendor motivation. I've never really got my head around that from a perspective, and I think it affects energy. I think when the agent believes the vendor's motivated, they work their butt off. When they don't think the vendor's motivated, they drop off. And so the vendor motivation is not really about the vendor. It's about how the agent perceives that vendor and what work they will or won't do. I'm a huge believer of allowing the process and allowing your workflows to determine the real vendor motivation. So there are a few little things that we talk about. You know, oftentimes you'll see through history, this is a number of cycles I've been through now. Unfortunately, I've been... And someone today called me a veteran and I nearly just I, I just looked at them and said, I, I, I'm not quite sure I fall in that category. But it's about allowing good processes, good communication, transparency in information, and I think that ultimately will determine 
the real desire for the homeowner to sell. Yeah, because people, despite what the market's doing, life goes on. Right? 100% people are it does. still going to have babies. People yep. are still going to unfortunately break up. Even beyond those obvious, you know, deaths, marriages, mm. births, and all that stuff that we talk about, there is just people looking to move on with their life, mm. downgrading, upgrading, wanting new as- jobs. jobs, you know, yeah. moving to more aspirational areas, aspirational homes, out of an apartment. That's going to continue. And at the end of every cycle, you'll see businesses and or agents emerge out of the pack every single time. And they emerge fundamentally or what projects them out of the pack is the energy in which they approached the market in the first place. They went out there looking for opportunities and they saw different things that the ones who have become paralysed by that. You reminded me of, I think, Chris Helder said in one of his recent speeches, he does that thing where he goes, oh, I'm tired, man. You know, like at 25, I'm tired. But if you're going to tell yourself that you're tired, you're going to end up tired. It's a funny thing. I was talking about one of the guys that I work with just recently about that tiredness. I've never seen Chris speak. Um, Mm. I've heard a lot of good things about his work. But someone said, do you get tired? And I said, yeah, I get tired on my flight home on a Friday afternoon. (laughs) because that's the first time I allow myself to get tired. I believe tiredness is a complete choice that you make, other than someone being sick or you've been up all night with a sick child, whatever. But you know what I mean, just from work, you know what I mean? And and I think every success should fuel energy. And I think what we look at through this climb of the change is aligning those excitement points to different parts, you know what I mean? The vendor coming to realisation that they're 50 grand too dear should be a point of excitement for you because you're working closely with that person who's starting to listen to you yeah. rather than saying, you know, well, I haven't found the buy yet, so I'm depressed. Well, if you keep working in the vendor in a way that they keep looking and with transparency adjust their price, eventually the buyer will turn up. Yeah. You know? You talked in Transform about this concept of three sales, yep. which everybody considered that to be like a real light bulb moment. Yep. So for the guys that weren't in Transform, yep. and, and it's really important now in the market yep. that we're in, can you just explain what you mean by the first, second and third well, sales? Well, our industry is an unusual industry on a lot of reasons. From the stock in component, which I talk about, I talk about flow, you know, stock in, stock out. It's that simple. Creating flow is what we're looking for. In the first part of the stock in, it's the most unusual industry in the world because we're the only industry in the world that knows where our customers live, which seems ironic. And you think about that a bit more, it opens up your thinking. The second part is the stock out, which is I referred to the three sales. Most people believe, and we're unusual in industry, in the fact that we actually have to make a number of sales before we get paid. Most people think that we have to make a sale to the vendor Mm -hmm. and we actually have to make a sale to the purchaser. I have to sell myself to you as the owner for you to give me your property. And then I've got to make a sale to the purchaser. And the second sale, the sale to the purchaser is actually the third sale. The second sale, which gets overwashed by the strength of the market, is obviously the sale to get the vendor to understand the position of their home. Mm -hmm. And that sale of the vendor finally going, I get it now, is as much a challenging sale as the other two can be. You walk in a lot of real estate businesses and, you know, I must admit now, Sam, I walk into mainly our brand, you know, Ray White's offices, but over my career, I've walked into many, many varied brands. You know, you see focus on stock in, you see focus on buys, but you very rarely see evidence inside a business that this is a tangible sale and a functional sale that the team are making to. Maybe the word sale is the wrong word, but, you know, keeping a vendor highly informed, transparency about communication, integrity in the way that you communicate, and that can be challenging for ways that most people don't understand, is where the money lives. You know, we have a saying that when the market's booming, the buyer creates the sale, and when the market flattens, the vendor creates the sale. And just the thought patterns and the workshopping for officers around that is you'll find a lot of answers for the questions you're asking at the moment. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly too, it's about the energy too because you can't get from one point to the other point without having some good energy in the middle where you get yep. the two to meet. Yep, and this may seem strange. This is, in most cases, the vendor's most valuable asset. There needs to be a, a real acknowledgement by people on that. And I say to all the guys that I work with, the vendor's quite within their rights to have high expectations. Mm. If we took a number of our properties or property to the market, 
We would have a high expectation of that. You know, you hear agents go, oh, I can't believe that Bender wants so much. Well, in a way, that's their job to want too much. Yeah. And don't get caught up in that. Well, they've arrived at that point for some information they've gathered. They've seen things sell. They, some of it's not tangible, what they want. Because, you know, there's all a lot of reasons how they arrived at that price. Mm. And they've arrived at that price because they've gathered their own information. Yeah. And I say, well, they've gathered information to arrive at that point. You've got to then enhance that information gathering that they've already done to help them see where they need to be to create a style. So often the vendors gather this information and then the agent walks up and tells without the gathering the information. It's illogical they could expect the shift that they needed. Yeah. You've also reminded me of something else that you said in Transform about controlling the conversation. Yeah. They're the powerful conversations. And I did say that, you know, the great agents have an ability to enhance or be part of the conversations that occur when they're not in the room. Mm. You know, I often ask agents who come for help, I say, let me ask the question, tell me what's happened on that home in the last seven days. You know, you've had one inspection or two inspections or no inquiry or or no offers, whatever that may look like. And then put yourself in the lounge room or the kitchen of the owners, let's say in this case husband and wife, Mm. and ask yourself what conversation do you think is going on. I mean, I sold a home a number of years ago with one of our best agents in our network, a guy called Michael Williams. Well, by the time that I had arrived the night before the auction, I had five report letters that were somewhere between 15 and 20 pages long with every person who'd been through on their feedback. I'd had a number of offers. We highlighted who were the potentials. And I sat there with my partner, Kelly, not talking about Michael's performance, but talking about the decision that we had to make tomorrow. Yeah. And it was a different, a different con- conversation. conversation and very comfortable with the fact that I realised that, like every other owner, I had to adjust my thinking, but comfortable in the fact about I had to adjust my thinking based upon the unbelievable level of information I had in front of me and the way he'd gather that, the way he presented that, the way he talked to me about that, and the way he approached the second sale at such a high level of professionalism. Yeah. At no stage did I feel like that he was trying to get me down or he was trying to lower. I just felt like he was just doing his job and keeping me informed. And he's the one of the best I've ever seen, you know, at that. And you realise that that type of repositioning can be done in a way that enhances the relationship with the consumer when it's done correctly. Absolutely. Well, I do remember you saying to the guys that if they didn't do something like a vendor report, isn't the vendor unlucky that they chose you? Yeah, I mean, a lot of our evidence and one of the beauties of having or working part of a very large network, you know, we are represented in most markets in the country. You know, mm. we're, as, we're as strong in Broome, you know, as we are in Warnable type of thing, you know what I mean, and on all destinations in between, you know. And our evidence shows that there is a much higher clearance rate, particularly out of the West at the moment, who's had a kind of tough time for a number of years now, as we all know. I mean, our evidence over there with, you know, Mark Whiteman, who's our leader over there, will show that a vendor who gets a vendor report will come to hand or come to market quite quicker. Now, people say to me, well, is that about the information that the vendor receives? And I'll add another piece for you now. Yes, that's one component. Mm. The other component is that what the agent has to do to actually create the report where the magic lives, you know. With an agent who goes, I need to get Sam a vendor report on a Tuesday night. I've got to get some people through the homes. I've got to get their feedback down. I've got to ask them on price because I want that to go as opposed to the agent who doesn't do vendor reports who probably doesn't go to the extent of doing those activities. It's the activities combined with the vendor report that create the movement that we're looking for. Yeah, I know that that was a really good tip and I know you've got a lot of agents out there hopefully still doing their vendor reports now. The other thing I just want to touch on before we head on to the Leadership Diaries, which is the real reason I've got you here today, you also talk about building an ecosystem around your own brand. Has that changed with the market in the last few months or what sort of things right now are the good agents looking to have close in their ecosystem. I came back from Inman. There were some interesting discussions on stage this year, but at the end of the day, what just keep coming through was love your database, build relationships, you know. And at the centre of any ecosystem is that relationship with your marketplace, the relationship with your homeowners, and how everything else 
kind of oscillates around that relationship and enhances that relationship. You know, your involvement in your community, you know, your presence online, your presence on social media, your presence even in print, you know what I mean, which we believe is still an integral part of an ecosystem. Now, the other things, the way that you communicate and what content you have to deliver a consumer, that's of value. You know, I think the consumers are past seeing you know, the only content they see is how many houses you sold last week, you know, that chestnut handshake in front of the signboard. I mean, how can we genuinely put the consumer at the centre of our ecosystem? Obviously, as markets get tougher, you know, believe it or not, something as kind of simple as a sold sticker on a board now becomes an integral part of your ecosystem. Mm -hmm. The consumer wants to be able to see that you can actually transact through these challenging times, you know, and it still remains to me that it's a combination of all those things that I see the better people who are the ones who are taking market share across different areas who are continuing to build their ecosystems in all aspects. One of the things I see a lot, when you must see it as well, is people just choose one channel so they see the next shiny thing so they drop. I tell the people that I work with, you shouldn't have an attachment to the outcome. You should just have attachment to doing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we run a formula, which I've used before, which is just volume over consistency multiplied by quality. Keep doing a lot of things consistently with a high-end quality and you will win in the end. So whether that happens to be talking to people face-to-face -face or whether that happens to be doing things on social media? Or well, whether... yeah, this is an interesting thing. You know, you mentioned social media there and you mentioned face-to-face. -face. And I think... One of the things I do well is ask pretty simple questions that evoke some thought patterns. You say to a group of people, you know, this is a relationship orientated industry. Would you agree with that? Everyone goes, yes. And then I say, well, make a list of all the people you have a relationship with that you've never spoken to. And they all look at me blankly. And there's a few of the other young guys, well, I've got a relationship with Mary on social media, hypothetically, you know. Yeah. And I get that. You can see that emerging. But is that a better relationship than if Barry had been talking to Mary nonstop for two years? Which relationship will that consumer weigh up? Now, I'm open to the fact that may change over time. I'm open to the fact that that's changing over the time. But, you know, I knew who you were before I spoke to you, mm. but we talk reasonably frequently now and so now we have a relationship. You know? Yeah, we did have another NLP coach that said, if you can email, great. If you can phone, that's better. If you can get face-to-face, -face, that's even better. Like your relationship yeah. deepens exponentially with each. Yeah, we use a formula in our company which, you know, is inherently everyone in our communities are sceptical of us as real estate agents. And moving that person from a sceptic through to an advocate is the journey that you want to take a consumer on and how each of those steps in the ecosystem, and one day I'll, you know, we'll talk further about that, how each other steps in the ecosystem play a role in moving that consumer from a sceptic to an advocate, you know, which is the person who you want to actually go and refer beyond their own transaction. Speaking of referrals, there's one thing that's always stuck with me that I remember, I think it was either you or if it was Jason that said, all of your processes that lead up to a particular point in time have to start with the testimonial that you want to receive in mind and then work backwards. So there's a lot of stuff about tech and a lot of stuff about social media. I mean, our strong position on all that stuff is that, you know, as you know, we spend enormous amounts of money and a lot of man hours trying to provide a platform through tech that our members need. I often sit back on a plane or ask why we do this and I'm coming clear in my thought patterns on this even though these things change all the time. But basically it is about just putting our people in front of more people at the right time. Yeah. If I can get our people talking to more people at the right time yeah. and be in the conversation with the consumer at the right time and if tech can help me do that more often. Yeah. Ultimately, then it's going to come back to our ability to enhance that consumer through the value that we offer and the way the agent talks to them. But that's what our tech's trying to do. It's keeping the agent at the centre of everything that we do and creating that vehicle, the tech's pointing the agent towards the right conversation at the right time. Oh, it's a fascinating space and I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of talk about that moving into the future is how we use technology to build relationships. Yeah, yeah. We're of the firm view that our technology is going to enhance the agent's position where all our work is heading towards enabling the agents to improve their position in their communities. 
Yeah, fantastic. So this interview is a part of a series we're calling mm-hmm. The Leadership Diaries. Yep where we ask, well, you're the chief of growth of Ray mm-hmm. White, so we've been dying to ask you these questions mm-hmm. to gain some insights into your expertise. And leadership is a really trending topic still, yeah. as you know, because yeah. you need yeah. your team around you these days. So are you ready? No, I'm ready, Sam. Okay. So what was your first job and what did it teach you? My first job at school is that I worked in the council pool in Bundaberg most of my life. And, you know, I was an average swimmer, but I worked at the local council pool. So most of my Saturdays and holidays were spent serving lollies over the counter at the local council pool. When I finished school, believe it or not, my first job outside of school is I'm a plumber by trade, right. uh, which most people don't know. And I'm on record as saying that I was the worst plumber in Australia. <laughs> and I learned three things plumbing. One was how to drink, unfortunately. One was how to gamble. Not that I do that too much, and one was to play 500. Unfortunately, I don't do many of those three things anymore, but I didn't learn much more out of plumbing than those three things, you know. Sounds like we'll have to sort out a game of cards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would forget how to play 500 now, you know, So, but that's what every lunchtime you played 500. What does the first hour of your day look like and how does it go after that? Are you a 5am clubber? Or? I wake up really early, much to the chagrin of Kel, you know. I'm away a lot, as you know, so I wake up. I'm normally a riser between quarter past five and half past five most mornings. I do a lot of thinking. I try to exercise a couple of times a week, believe it or not. Um, So I try to do that. But I spend most of my time thinking about some of our bigger projects and then I start to think about the day-to-day of what the immediacy of it. But I'm a deep thinker, so I spend a lot of time thinking. Yeah. Which can be a good thing and a bad thing, let me tell you. It you know, can, you know it can at be. three o'clock in the morning, it's a terrible <laughs> thing, you know, but at quarter past five, I'm okay with it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. What's the most important thing you're working on and how are you making that happen? Uh, probably two things, to be honest. Supporting the network over the next change of cycle, that's all hands on pump, and then we need some urgency around that and how we do that. There's a huge percentage of the industry that haven't been faced with. These, these, conditions. Con- these conditions. So there's an immediacy work around that. The kind of ongoing work is just enhancing our ability to put our people in front of the right people at the right time. So that's always the ongoing project. That really hasn't changed. But the urgency around support of the network through, I think, the next six months as they come to grips with that, I think we're full court press on that at the moment, you know. Yeah, Absolutely. Can you name someone that's had a big impact on you as a leader? My father, unfortunately, Dad passed away a number of years ago. But Dad, it's funny, you know, Dad wasn't in business as such like I am today. But often when I have to make a decision, I ask what my father would do or what my father would think. My father had really strong values, which are really important to me. So I often think about that from a value perspective. There's probably two other people. Most people know that I spent some time working with Andrew Bell as a junior partner in Service Paradise. Andrew was hugely influential for me as a young guy and to this day I'm very, very, very pleased that Andrew and I have a great relationship and we speak regularly and I do some work in his team now, which I thoroughly enjoy. And Brian White, I mean, one of the real joys is I have spent an enormous amount of time with Brian. I'm on record saying that I think Brian is the most influential person in our industry in the country. Mm. If you understand the story and where he's come from to where he is today and to hear guidance and kind of mentorship from someone so humble and just such a good man, it's such a joy to come to work every day. Mm. Who are you learning from right now? Who am I learning from? I learn a lot from our digital and tech teams, you know, who aren't kind of handcuffed by being real estate agents. They're really refreshing in the way they view things and the way they view the world. I'm doing some change management work with myself with a, a lady in Brisbane called Belinda Brosnan who we got to speak at our, one of our kind of gatherings about 50 offices recently. I'm finding that really enjoyable. There's a lot of change going on and it's difficult to detach yourself from the thought that's been embedded in you and I'm really trying to learn the art of letting go and I'm really enjoying that journey. You know, one of the things we do as an exercise, I start the first week of every year I'm giving away one of my secrets here, that I actually spend the first week of every year acting like I know nothing about real estate. Yeah. And I just kind of walk around the network and I think some of our people think I'm a nutter because I, <laughs> I go, what do you do that for? Just really trying to 
clear the slate because there's so much confirmation bias that you have when you kind of play a role that I and many other people do in the industry, just trying to let go of traditional thinking. Some of that's still valuable, let me tell you, you know, the way we interact with the consumer is valuable. Just trying to layer that with the difference. So I'm getting a lot of learnings from a lot of people at the moment. What's your favourite question to ask someone in a job interview? I want to know a couple of things. I want to know about their motor, about their energy. For me, I think that you can teach skill. Someone who's got great drive, someone who's got great drive, great energy, openness. Oftentimes, you and I have seen it, we can wander around our industry and we can see people with all the skill in the world not Mm. doing very well. I like to ask questions about drive. Tell me where you had a difficult situation and you worked through that. These are challenging times. There's difficult situations that we're faced with all the time. That's more important for me than someone giving me a CV, which I've never seen a bad one yet, and then tell me they've got all the skills. Skills not unimportant, don't get me wrong, but they're the things I look for. What's one characteristic that you think every leader needs today in 2018? Empathy. What's the worst advice you've ever heard given to someone starting their career in real estate? Well, this will be interesting. (laughs) One of the things that I think is changing in our industry is it's all about making money as quickly as we can, you know, and I think that's the problem, you know. I see so often where young people... Uh, you know, get thrown into an office, hoping not hours anymore, and, you know, they're kind of judged by how quickly they can get a listing. And oftentimes I say, you know, you haven't helped this person build structures, build databases, and they end up having this opportunistic type of business where they're going from hand to mouth all the time. And believe it or not, I think I have a saying that speed kills and hasten slowly, you know. Mm, I love that. I've heard you say that before. Yeah. And I've also heard you say too that sometimes what kills careers quicker than anything is more listings. Well, that's an interesting topic at the moment and we've been doing a lot of talks about that to our network. Of course, we need listings to make sales, you mm. know, but hear me talk about flow. It's about stock in and stock out. Unfortunately, as many agents are finding at the moment, in this market, you don't get paid for listing them. Mm. In the past market, you probably did. Yeah. But in this market, you don't get paid for listening. You get paid for selling. You get paid for creating flow. And the analogy I gave our teams the other day was just imagine a bath full of water. The tap's turned off, you pull the plug out, and the water doesn't get away. What do you do? And everyone goes, well, you call the plumber. And I go, but I see officers who have a, a fair bit of stock, so the bath's full, the plug's not draining, and the way they handle that problem is to turn the tap on more. Yeah. <laughs> and when you put it in that context, it doesn't make any logical sense. The reason the water's not getting away or the reason that the water's not getting away is not market-driven. It's process-driven. And it's like, well, I don't want to deal with the process of clearing the water, so I'll turn more water on and see if I can just get lucky with something coming out of the tap. Yeah, it's not sustainable. No, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. No, it's not. What's the biggest message that you want the folks attending Connect this year? Because Ray White's got its big conference this yeah, year, we got three, a, three years. We've got somewhere in the vicinity of 3,000 people going. It's important for people at Connect to understand one of the huge values of Ray White, as you've seen, and, you know, is we regard ourselves as a big family. Mm. We're still completely family-owned. Yep. The family are entrenched in every part of what we do. Many of us, like myself, feel very much part of that family. So it's important for our people to feel that they are part of a family. Important to understand that we are continually reinvesting in value for them to extend their careers. We are still 100% at the belief of putting the agent at the centre of everything and then supporting their careers. For our people to leave Connect knowing that we're investing in the right areas to do that, that we're 100% supportive no matter what market conditions. And our focus is still to provide a network and a platform for people to have enriched lives. And I think that's a really important thing for us. What are your goals for the next 12 months? What's next for Mark McLeod? My ultimate goal is for the continuation that my family and friends are all happy and healthy. That's obviously at the centre of everything that we do and I do. You know. For our network to feel really supported that we, uh, as an organisation, we have a saying internally in Ray White that Ray White sells better in light winds. 
we believe that our history and our broadness have been able to support our Western Australian network through a difficult time. Yeah. And through that support, they've been able to support us with better understandings of how to navigate through those times. Our network's very open and we've had many of our Western Australian agents and owners and leaders back into the East already. And that cross flow of information for us, we're able to gain from being in all marketplaces is an integral part. You see many brands that move outside of their core demographics and fundamentally get challenged at times. Yeah. One of the great uniquenesses of our brand is that we're one of the few groups that have been able to jump demographics. We're in Sydney now, we're strong in Lower North Shore as we are in Double Bay, as we are in Broome, as we are in Warrnambool, as we are in all parts of Australia and New Zealand and Indonesia. I think one of the real credits to Brian in particular, his ability to see us move across demographics and our processes are robust enough to handle the most expensive homes in Australia and our, our processes handle some of the cheapest homes in Australia. And our people in those areas get enormous value out of what we offer. So the continuation of that and for our people to feel safe and comfortable inside our network is a real focus on us, you know. Ray White's part of my family now. Yeah. My youngest cousin's just gone to work over at Bankstown. Oh, really? So <laughs> shout out to Craig if you're listening. I, I was with Tony Romanos. Yeah, that's a very good business. So they'll do really well, you know, over there with Tony. So yeah. Very good. The family stretches far and wide. Very far and wide. It's amazing, you know, in social environments when you tell somebody you work for Ray White, everyone says, oh, i got a friend, oh, i got a cousin, oh, i got a sister. Yeah. You know, it, it's amazing how the brand of our size is now part of the Australian psyche in many ways, you know, which has been great to be part of for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast and no thank worries. you for your ongoing contributions to Elite Agent. I I know there's a lot of people that read your column. I'm a huge fan of Seth Godin. I think I've said that before, you know. And I'm amazed at how Seth is able to write a blog 365 days of the year. One of the joys mm. in New York just recently, I actually ran into Seth at a coffee shop in the Chelsea markets, you oh, know, wow. and I had a 10-minute discussion with him. And I asked him about that question, and which he has since blogged about. I'm sure not about our conversation, you know, but he did say that you have to write with the freedom of it doesn't matter if no one reads it. Yeah. You know, kind of teaching yourself to be able to write where I hope everyone reads it. Just write for what you think and feel, I think, has been a, a good journey for me. So I enjoy it. So thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you so much for being on the podcast this morning. No problem. Thanks, Anne. Enjoyed it. To subscribe to the magazine, visit eliteagent.com.au forward slash subscribe.